I'll never forget. Because I know what it's going to sound like, but it was love at first sight, right? It was. 30-something years later, we're here, and we're going to tell quite a story. So where are we going to start? March 15, 1995. When I walked into your shop for the very first time, looking for a job, for those that don't know the story, I walked into the Lane shop and you were an entrepreneur at the age of 16. You owned the shop, you owned the salon when you were 16 with your brother. I remember smelling your sweater before you came in. <laughs> <laughs> I loved hair, man. I loved it so much. And I walked into you guys' shop. It was, it was actually really love at first sight. It was that humor. 30-something years later, I think it's still that humor. I mean, we annoy people. We always used that humor, never caring about whether other people liked it or not. And I think that is the power of everything uh, that we build. So you didn't hire me. But you did advise me because you guys own a shop of a franchise to go talk with the big kahuna. The big of, boss. Yeah. And that's how I got my shop in Rotterdam. But I am not an entrepreneur. I just did not. I just didn't care because it was all about but hair. But it was not we bringing in any money at all. No. I was up to my neck in debt. Yeah. And through that chain that we worked for, we kept meeting each other and you moved to Rotterdam. I was doing really good on paper, but I was also missing something in my life. I wanted to grow, I wanted something different. There was like an emptiness that I couldn't fill up. You had nothing to do with hair anymore, you were just going from shop to shop, solving problems in those shops. And I had this little two-chair illegal barber shop. It was in the squad. You need to have my number. It was like a speakeasy. You needed to have my number. And then you started hanging out there and it got busier and it got a little out of hand actually. And that's when we got the first idea because it was such a special place. A place where you want to be part of and it was hard to get in. What if we can catch this feeling and make a shop out of it? Yeah. Then we said, let's do this. I was on the internet. I was at the library studying about this whole barber thing. And you were out there, you know, literally making plans. I had to go out there to look for a space. I had to talk to banks. I had to talk to accountants, to uh, insurance guys, because everything had to be arranged. We didn't really know what we were looking for yet. As long as history go back, when you look at the history of the barbershop, it's always been the spider in the web. It's always been in the middle of a community. You would go to the barbershop to clean up first and learn about that certain town, because that barber would know the right a saloon to go to the brothel, whatever, they were always, so it had to be that specific place. And all of a sudden I got that one. That absolutely beautiful, amazing little shop on the corner, because when that shop came free... I called you up and we went there straight away. We signed the lease and then we, we had like, okay, we're going to do like two months of renovation. We wanted to create the place that we would want to go to. But first, we went to Ireland. Ireland. <laughs> I remember that you were so stoked about that guy that you found on the internet. Liam. The yeah. legend. And we went to we went to Dublin. And Liam was doing this beautiful straight razor shapes with the original razor. And I know I was obsessed. I was obsessed with that shop. That was just the first trip of so many to come in the name of Schornem and Ruzel. But to be honest, Liam was a really bad teacher. 
<laughs> yeah, we weren't allowed to touch the razor. We were just like, you stand there. And then I took it, and he was like, no, 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 let me show you let first. Let me show you. And then all the hair was gone. <laughs> we still couldn't shave. No. I got a phone call from the father of my ex-wife. He had a friend that was an amateur antique collector, and he found a back bar somewhere in Belgium. You were like, let's get in the car and go there now. We drove to this very small town in Belgium, and we walk in and we go like, we heard you got a back bar. And we go around the corner. There it is, 120 years old, mint condition, all the drawers, the marble. It was made by a master carpenter. And the quality of that craftsmanship surviving through a century going from grandfather to his son to his son. And it resonated. We were like, oh, this is it. We talked about it because you got a reasonable price, but that reasonable price was still, still half of the complete budget of the complete shop. And the moment we bought that one, everything changed. Nine months long, every day looking for that perfect name. And we had that back bar and we were like, wait a minute, we're not American, we're Dutch. That's when we started talking about a name in Dutch. We were at your house and I was like, maybe I should Google old Dutch swear words. Gaius, rapaya, and then I saw schorum. Schorum meaning the scum of the nation, the lowest of the lowest. I remember walking into the room where you were, Igor was, and I go like, guys, I have it. I have it. I'm gonna call it schorum. And without a second of doubt, you said Arsneider and Barbier. That made it really classy. It made it classy. And then the ideas just started flowing. Everything had to be old Dutch. And we made a joke. If we ever make a pomade, we're going to call it Ruzel. Ruzel is, of course, lard, the, the fat of the belly of the pig. You got to understand, we were in Rotterdam. And Rotterdam has a reputation of giving nicknames to everything you know we love that little play of words it's a very local thing but what we loved about it is the very first pomades ever to be made were made out of animal fat we literally said to each other if people go to a shop called schorum they might just put rusel in their hair absolutely There are a couple of things that are really important. The name and the floor. This is something I learned from you because everybody looks at the floor when they walk in. We were looking at new tiles and they were expensive. But then all of a sudden I remembered that the guy where we bought the back bar had old tiles. Yeah. But they were also twice as expensive. <laughs> I remember that so well. We went and then, so over the top with that shop. When the floor and the back bar, we were pretty much through. I the remember hole. that you scraped money, I scraped money because we didn't have a lot. I know, I know. We went in deep. And it is a beautiful floor. That floor is the most copied floor in the world. Absolutely. Now. The um, opening party was epic because we asked the bar next door, how many barrels? He says, well, how many people are you expecting? And we were like, I don't know, 100, 200. He was like, well, you probably need two barrels of beer. We ended up four barrels of beer. Yeah. We had live music. The Bluegrass Boogeyman. Bluegrass Boogeyman. There were so many people there. We invited uh, press. But press was invited until 2 o'clock. But after 2 o'clock, we thought like, well, if they're going after 2 o'clock, we might not be able to talk anymore. <laughs> I didn't even know when the party finished. We got so much booze in the opening party as gifts yeah. that we could drink for the four months to come. That's what we thought. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> and then, um, then we opened up. Yeah. <laughs> We 
opened up. It was mayhem. Unbelievably hungover. So we only had yeah. opening hours. We opened at 11. Yes, because we actually calculated our hangovers back yeah. then. I had five people in a row that wanted to shave. <laughs> I was panicking, like, really? Yeah, we, we still thought that a shave was going to be something people would ask for, like, once a week or whatever, but that became the big thing. The first week was really busy. And then uh, nothing happened. We were close to going bankrupt. We had girlfriends at home. I had a pregnant wife at home. There was no money. We were about to fail. So we, we had a problem. So we did what we always do when we have to solve a problem. We drank. We drank. <laughs> we got the shop. Three months, we were close to going bankrupt. We asked friends from bands, you know what, come in, we'll give you a haircut so the shop looks busy. And it started growing. And then slowly it started growing a little bit more. So David was like, we have to show the world what you do in the shop and we're gonna film it. So when I showed up in Rotterdam, I went to the shop and I was completely blown away. And I just couldn't shoot enough pictures. The world just couldn't get enough of the scumbag barbers of Rotterdam. This was the very, very first time that we went viral. That was like the first time we had an eight hour line outside. I think so. It was the haircuts that brought everything together, right? I think that that was the only thing that we were serious about. The rest was all a big laugh. <laughs> <laughs>